Orlando. Orlando. Welcome to the Ozone. Welcome to the Ozone. Welcome to the Ozone. Welcome to the Ozone. The voice of massive magic fans. Welcome back to another episode of the Ozone Podcast, the voice of magic fans. In the virtual studio today, we have Justin. Yo. Al. Hey, what's going on? Myself, Anthony, and a very special guest joining us, Magic Hall of Famer, David Steele. Hey, fellas. David, how we doing? Great. How are you guys? Doing good, doing good. Thank you so much for joining us. David, what, are, what have you been doing during this uh, quarantine? Have you been keeping yourself busy? Well, that's a, that's a challenge, isn't it? Staying busy. Um, but uh, my wife and I, pretty quickly after the thing shut down, about two weeks into it, uh, we decided we would head up to North Carolina. We've got a small cabin up in uh, uh, the foothills of North Carolina. And so we, we, we decided we'd go up there. It's uh, talk about social distancing. That's no problem up at our cabin. Uh, <laughs> the closest house is about a quarter of a mile away. And uh, it's beautiful up there. The weather was great through the month of April. So uh, it was it was a great, uh, great opportunity for us. I mean, it was just my wife and I and, uh, and our uh, our little dog named Coach. And uh, we we, uh, we we spent all, you know, the month of April together and uh, nothing was open. There was really nothing to do. We went to the grocery store. We, we did our carry out from the little town close by. And um, we, we've got some friends up there that we, we've become pretty close to um, over time. And they, one of them owns a restaurant. Another one is a builder. And uh, we were able to, uh, to chat with them a little bit. And, you know, it was really interesting to get a feel for small town America, you know, and what people are going through out, uh, out, out you know, in the real world, away from the big cities. And um, this thing has been devastating, obviously, for a lot of people, more than just the virus, what it's done uh, and all the lives it's claimed. And, uh, you know, so it was it was a real eye opener for us to be in, in that environment for, for the month of April. We came back, uh, I think it was May the 6th or 7th. We came back to Orlando and we've been here since. And uh, probably doing what a lot of you guys are doing. I, I have been going through a lot of old magic scorebooks. I keep a scorebook from every game, you know, and I've got them all since 1989, all the ones that I've broadcast. And uh, I make notations uh, often at the bottom of the page or in the side margins. And I haven't looked at that, you know. I mean, life goes on, and before you know it, you're 30 years into it, 31 years. And I haven't stopped and pulled out old books and looked at them and uh, so I've been looking at old notes, old scorebooks that I kept, and uh, I think what I'm going to do is put a spreadsheet together of all the notes that I took on all the games, and so I'll have a better idea of some of the things that happened because I had forgotten about some of the some of the things that happened in games uh, way back in Magic history, all the way back to 1989. So that's been kind of a fun venture for me too. Wow, I can just imagine there's a lot of good stuff in there that you're finding and kind of remembering from from those days. Absolutely. Yeah, that is awesome. You know, not nothing. A lot of times, not very big, and uh, sometimes I, you know, I look at it and I think, why did I even write that down? That's not very interesting or significant. But um, you know, at the time, I, I guess I thought it was. But you know, a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. But maybe you know, there may be a book in here one day. Who knows? There you go. Now, David, let's get to let's get to uh, know you a little better for those listeners that, that again may not know you so well as far as where you came from uh, growing up. Yeah. So growing up, who what was your favorite sport? Um, I played baseball and basketball, and, uh, you know, as a kid, I played baseball, Little League Baseball, and uh, as I was coming up, there weren't opportunities to play a lot of basketball until you got to your school team, but, uh, you know, I made my school team, played high school basketball, high school baseball, played a little college baseball, I got a, a college scholarship to a Carson Newman College, I was a shortstop, light hitting, good fielding shortstop, and I played one year, I was on scholarship at a small school in Tennessee, Carson Newman. And realized that uh, my dream of Major League Baseball was not going to materialize when I batted 155, which happened to match my weight at the time. So uh, that's, that's not a good thing. So I gave up uh, that, that, that dream, really. And I had that dream until then. I, you know, I mean, I was a good high school baseball player. And probably every good high school baseball player thinks, yeah, maybe there's a chance. But, so I realized my freshman year of college that I wasn't going to be a professional baseball player. Transferred to the University of Georgia. And um, that's, uh, that's where I did my uh, last three years of college. I got into broadcasting school, um, just kind of fell into broadcasting. Uh, you know, I'm not one of those. I mean, I know a lot, of, a lot of my peers that, you know, when they were five years old, they thought about being broadcaster. That's not me. I, I thought I was going to be a pro athlete until I was 19 years old. 
and this seemed like the best way to, to stay involved in sports. You know, I thought sports writing, sports casting, I found that I had a knack for broadcasting and, uh, you know, that's, that's where it started. University of Georgia broadcasting uh, school and uh, the campus radio station. That's uh that's interesting to hear because we were speaking with Jeff Turner not too long ago and he also started off with baseball, so it's um awesome to hear that you guys have that type of connection. Big first baseman, yeah. We've talked about it. We've talked about everything a lot. We we uh, I bet. spent a lot of time together, but yeah, I know Jeff was a good baseball player too. He outgrew baseball, I guess. Now now growing up, who I mean, you lived in Tennessee. What what type of exposure in terms of who was your favorite team and player um, when you were young when you were younger? Yeah. My dad was a University of Kentucky graduate and um, he was uh, he was a huge Wildcat alum. And um, my parents were from Kentucky, the southeastern part of the state, rural Kentucky. And so I was a big Kentucky fan. I was a huge Kentucky basketball fan. Kaywood Ledford was the radio voice of the Kentucky Wildcats. And he was, uh, you know, he was I just thought he was sensational. John Ward was the voice of, of the Tennessee Volunteers. I grew up in Knoxville, Tennessee. So I grew up on SEC basketball and football, and, and uh, those were the voices of my childhood in sports. Um, transistor radio about, you know, three inches by five inches. Uh, you guys are too young to know about this, but you tuck it under your pillow at night, and uh, you turn that dial and find an AM station, a clear channel 50,000 watt station from, you know, 700, 800 miles away and listen to a college or pro basketball or baseball game. And, that's how I went to bed pretty much every night. I, you know, I'm sure my mom and dad knew, knew what I was doing. There goes the dog. Um, I, I'm sure they knew what I was doing, but I had that, that, uh, that radio tucked under my pillow listening to sports. And those were my teams, the Kentucky Wildcats and basketball. And my baseball team was the Cincinnati Reds growing up in Knoxville. That was, that was the team. We traveled to Crosley Field as a family once every summer and spend a weekend at the Holiday Inn near the stadium and catch a, a series. Pete Rose... Uh, back in the early 60s, mid 60s, when I was 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, uh, um, the Cincinnati Reds, that was my team. So some great glory years for the Reds back then with Pete Rose in the, in the team. So great time to be a fan for sure. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. That is awesome. Now, David, I know after you got into broadcasting again, you kind of stumbled upon it, made it a career, obviously. Um, you were with the Gators for about seven years where you did some football uh, broadcasting but eventually you do land with the Orlando Magic. How did that all come to fruition? Well, like you mentioned, um, you mentioned that uh, Al, I was the, uh, the radio announcer for the Gators um, from 82 to 80, 89, 88, 89. And um, prior to that, I was, uh, I was a television sportscaster in Asheville, North Carolina, and did play-by-play -play on radio for the Western Carolina Catamounts. So, um, uh, I guess you got you kind of need to go back. The Gators hired me in 1982 from uh, from Asheville, and that was the huge that was the huge break in my career. You know, to go from um, local TV sports anchor, um, voice of the Western Carolina Catamounts, to the play-by-play -play announcer for the Florida Gators at age 29 um, in 1982. Huge break for me in my career. And then about uh, the summer of '88, I got a call from. Uh, a man named Bob Poe, who was the director of broadcasting for the Orlando Magic, who had yet to uh, play a game. Um, I had followed through the media in Gainesville that Orlando got an NBA team with Miami. And so I was interested, you know, in, in those developments. But um, that call just came out of the blue, just a phone call. Um, would you be interested in talking with us? And, you know, I, I've talked to my wife about it. Um, obviously, the Gators play by play job. Mick Hubert's been there 31 years. Um, I, I could very easily be going into my 62nd year as the voice of the, uh, not 62nd, that would be 31 plus nine. It would be like 40 years as the voice of the Gators, you know, something like that. I, you know, I very well could have stayed there. I mean, it was, it was a great job, great situation. So, uh, you know, I said, yeah, let's talk. Let's talk. And um, I came down to Orlando in the, in the late uh, summer, early fall of 88, met with Pat Williams. And uh, when I met Pat, that was that kind of turned everything in, in, in the direction that I, that I kind of felt like I was headed because he was such a great salesman. He was such a, such a, um, a magnetic, had such a magnetic personality. He convinced me that Orlando was going to be enormously successful as an NBA city. And, um, and, and I talked with a few people that I knew 
Um, Pete Van Weren, who you may or may not have ever heard of, he was a Braves announcer for many years, passed away some years ago. And uh, a man named Bob Neal, two of my closer friends, older mentors in broadcasting. And they both told me the same thing, pretty much, that um, be very careful about what pro sports team you go to because they're not all created equally. You know, it's more about the ownership, the leadership, the management, and they're, they're, you, you can get into a very bad situation. So just be sure about the people. So when I met Pat Williams, I felt really good about, um, about the, the direction, the, the leadership of the franchise. And you know, we made the big move. I mean, it was a, it was a tough decision to leave the Gators at that age. Um, you know, I, was, I was very young. I was still th- mid-30s. And um, the opportunity came, and we, we took it. We moved. Uh, we had three children, small children, and moved from Gainesville to Orlando. And, um, it's, uh, you know, our kids are Gators. I mean, especially our, our oldest son, who's probably older than all of you guys. But, uh, you know, he's, he's a huge Gator fan, uh, even to this day, graduate of the, of the university. And so our kids are Gator fans because of those seven great years we spent in Gainesville. But now this is 31 seasons with the Magic. So uh, it's, been a, it's been a great run here. Yeah, so you know it was the right decision to make because 31 years later, you're still here. You're still synonymous with being the voice of Orlando, in my opinion. Uh, listening to national, you know, the few nationally broadcasted games that the Magic have, it's like, no, I'd rather go back on Fox Sports and listen to David <laughs> and Jeff. It just feels natural. Uh, it feels like that's the way it should be. So kind of spinning it forward a little bit, uh, let's talk about, you know, some Magic basketball. How did Is This Anything come about? Because that's a segment that everybody loves. Everybody's waiting on the bell or the buzzer. Uh, could you talk <laughs> us through how that came about as well as how much research goes into it? How do you find the topics that you cover? Sure. You know, I just find it really interesting and, and it's sort of ironic that after all of these years of broadcasting, you know, we come up with this sort of goofy idea and it, it has taken a life of its own and is, you know, has become kind of a monster <laughs> for, for all of us because we got to continually come up with stuff and I've got to, I've got to keep this gig going because it, people seem to really like it. But, um, you know, it was fun, but it, at the same time, it's somewhat of a burden because, like I said, you know, it's, now it's, uh, it's created uh, a following and uh, there's a responsibility that I feel to, to keep doing it. But the origin of it was, um, I, is it three? I think, it's, I think we've done three seasons of it now. Am I right? Now you guys might know. I think it, I believe we've done three full seasons. Three well, sounds like, about right. Three, so it was three years ago in our pre, uh, pre-season production meeting, um, all of us get together. Ty Easton is our producer, um, does a great job, you know, overseeing the broadcast, um, the, the game-by-game broadcast. We meet with Ty, Jeff Turner, me, Dante Marcatelli, um, the director, Greg Hartung. You know, it's just the full, everybody that works the broadcast. And we try to come up with ideas. What can we do to make the broadcast interesting? You know, little things, whether it's music, adding a touch here, a touch there, just production elements. You know, everybody's trying to think of what, what can we do to, to be better. I mean, you, you know, that, that's what you do in life. You try, no matter how long you've worked in a job, you want to continue to uh, to grow and, and add things to, to what you do in your job. So um, I brought up the idea that, you know, I because it, my personality is to, um, I do a lot of research for every game and I come up with all these crazy, sometimes bizarre stats or, or nuggets, I call them nuggets. And, um, and I would throw them out of production meetings over all of these years of broadcasting the games. And I would inevitably say, I, I don't know, is this anything? And, you know, and everybody would look around and usually laugh at me and say, that's, you know, that's ridiculous. And so I brought up, you know, this, that, you know, how about these things that I come up with, these nuggets that we call them? How about if we just do, is this anything? And we, we you know, we name, we label it that. And, um, and I'll come up with something for every game and then, and then Ty, I think it was Ty, our producer, that said, you know, let's do a bell or a buzzer out of the truck. And, you know, everybody just kept ch- chipping in ideas of how to do it. So that's where it started. I mean, it, it, it starts with uh, just um, something that I do naturally and normally. And we've taken it and we've expanded it and just made it sort of ridiculous now with, you know, the graphics and the music and everything um, that goes along with it and, and, and the acting that goes on with Jeff and, and me and pretending that we um, you know, upset with each other or whatever. The fans secretly enjoy all of the, the World Wrestling Federation stuff that we had to it as well. So it's, uh, you know, we're just having a good time with it. And 
Uh, so, but I, I, you know, I got to come up with something every game. I haven't had a lot of help. I'll have to say that, you know, I, I uh, most, uh, I'd say 99.9% of the stuff that has thrown out there, I've come up with them. Wow. So is it one of those things? Um, I just have to ask, is it one of those things where before you bring it up, you know, whether it's going to get a bell or a buzzer or you kind of in the moment, just got to wait for that. I have a feeling, you know, when I come up with something, when I, when we meet, because we meet every game day at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, and so I know going in, you know, I have an idea. They're, they're going to look at me like, you know, they're, they're, <laughs> you you got to be joking or, or they're going to say, wow, that's great. And, and so part of the fun is to, you know, go into the meeting, not knowing exactly what the reaction is going to be from the crew. Right. And, uh, and, or, or just the opposite. I know what the reaction is going to be and I'm ready for it. Now, you know, I've got a zinger ready to fire back at him or something. <laughs> But, uh, no, we do. We, we, you know, we have fun with it. So everybody knows everybody's in on the deal at 10 o'clock in the morning, what we're doing. And of course the graphic has to be built and, you know, and we talk about it and, um, you know, I got kind of get an idea which way Ty, uh, the producer, um, and Jeff Turner are thinking, you know, I kind of, I kind of feel like I understand where they're going to, where they're going to hit me on the, on the broadcast, but I'm never really sure because, Sometimes they'll uh, decoy me at, in, in the 10 o'clock meeting and then hit me at, with another from another direction during the game. So it's fun. We have a great time with it. Yeah, it's it's funny, David, because we have a group chat while we watch the Magic games, and there'll be instances where um, we hear what it is, and we hear that you didn't get a bell for it. We're just like, man, we need to talk to the bus because David definitely <laughs> deserved a bell, you yeah. know, nine times out of ten at the very least. You know, some of that I, I really believe. The tie, he just wants to see my reaction because he yeah. knows. <laughs> yeah, that sounds right. He knows I deserve a bell, and he just sometimes he'll have the camera on me. You know, they'll they'll have you know eyes on, knowing that my reaction is going to be you know, <laughs> something that they can air later. So it's all part of the show. All right now, now David, um, post Dwight, we obviously went through a drought where we didn't see any playoff basketball, um, and then last year happens and we get our first playoff, you know, action in quite some time. Um, what was it like calling game three for the first playoff game here in Orlando after going so long without, you know, being in that type of environment? Yeah, it just felt so good. It was so good to see the Amway Center um, alive like that again, because like you said, um, you know, there, there were a lot, of, a lot of lean years in there from uh, Dw and, and even Dwight's last year. I mean, let's face it, that was not a lot of fun. It was a playoff team, but um, things fell apart in March and April and, uh, Dwight was was out for the playoffs with a back injury. Um, you know, it was big baby steam. <laughs> we always get that. And uh, so, you know, that was a, that was kind of a weird season too. So, you know, add that on to the mix of, of tough years. So it was great to see the franchise headed back in a what I feel like is a really positive direction last year. And then uh, I, I feel like before the, the break with the virus, that uh, the team was starting to hit the same stride that they hit last year at about the same time. So unfortunately, you know, we, we didn't get to see that finish, but you know, maybe later in the summer we will. How do you, how would you say the fan engagement kind of impacts the way you approach the broadcast? Does it change anything for you? Um, not really, because when you put the headphones on, if you've ever done a, if you've ever done a game, I mean, you're, you're in your own world. Um, However, when the crowd is really, really juiced, then it does, uh, it does, uh, you know, lift you, your, 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 uh, your tone to a whole different level. But, you know, unless it's really on top, I mean, unless the crowd is really over the top, then, uh, then every game is pretty much, as far as the, the crowd is concerned, is pretty much the same. But when you get into a real hot environment with a huge game and the crowd is really lifting everybody up, then you get carried and swept up in it, too. Yeah, and David, how do you feel about the NBA? I know we're, we're starting to hear rumors about the NBA possibly coming to Orlando, uh, coming to agreements with Disney to, to host uh, the season continuing here. Um, how do you feel about that? Are you excited about getting back on the sidelines and, and calling some more Magic games here um, this summer? Well, sure. I think everybody wants to see it happen. Um, I, I don't have any information, probably even less than what you guys have, but <laughs> if, if you stay in touch with with um, you know all the all the people that are really locked into it, but um, all I can say is that the the NBA is going to be very diligent. They're going to be very careful about how they do it. Um, 
They're going to be. They're going to think of all the angles. I, I feel like the NBA is in great hands with Adam Silver's leadership. Um, we couldn't be in better hands than uh, than what we have in that commissioner. And uh, I feel very good that if it happens, it will be done right. And it's going to be really something very special if it does happen. Yeah, I, I think that a lot of us, we've gone so long without just sports in general that no matter what it is that they decide, we're just ready to get back to some type of you know, normality to where we can, again, start to watch um, watch the games and, and get back to Magic Basketball. It's such a big part of our of our society. I mean, it's 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 a it's Americana sports is right. I think we're we're all realizing how much it means to us, you know, and how how important it is. I mean, it uh, it's 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 certainly given me that perspective. Um, uh, you know, just from a just uh, it just makes you feel good. I mean, you know, you aspire to be great like those athletes. I mean, it gives you something to look up to, have heroes to look up to, and people that can do extraordinary things. The human body is an amazing thing, and these, these athletes do incredible things uh, night after night. And uh, not being able to witness that, I think it's been a real drain on our on our national psyche. So it's going to be good to get it back, not just because, you know, we all love basketball, but I think the nation needs, needs basketball, baseball, football. We need sports back in our life. Yeah, especially when they just take the game away from you without warning or anything, just gone completely. Uh, but – but David, let me ask you: How how excited are you about um, the current roster that we have, and and also looking forward to you know what the future makeup would be of this team? Well, I think uh, Weltman and Hammond have done a great job uh, putting a a group of players together that have a chance to grow into something special. I mean, uh, Jonathan Isaac looks like a really special talent uh, coming off an injury, but. You love the pieces with Bamba and Isaac and uh, the young core um, that could uh, really grow and, and become something special. Um, I think we're headed in the right direction. Like I said earlier, I, right before the the league was shut down, I felt like things were were about to pick up in a big way. Disappointed that we didn't have a chance to, to see that happen, but I see nothing but good things down the road. Yeah, I think we can all start to see again that, that youth finally coming to what we expect it to become. Uh, we see it every single day. Obviously, we've got a lot of young players in our team, but you can see Isaac, you know, the body filling up finally. You see Fultz made huge strides from October to March. So I think the future is, exciting. I mean, super bright for, for us Orlando Magic fans. Um, now, for you specifically, as you sit on the sidelines calling the games, who is one player that you enjoy watching night in and night out on our team? Well, I, you know, you mentioned Markel Fultz. I mean, he did some things this year that um, not, not many human beings in the world can do. Some of the things that just take your breath away, his ability to explode to the basket and throw down a dunk. And, you know, it's just such a, a an, a, an electric athlete. So he's spectacular. Obviously, Aaron Gordon is one of the great dunkers of all time. Um, Jonathan Isaac is starting to do things that uh, turn your head and everybody's talking about the next day. You know, that's, that's the thing about the job that, that I have and that as NBA fans, we, we appreciate is that on any given night, you might see something that everybody's talking about tomorrow. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we have several guys on our roster that could be that guy. So, uh, you know, I think uh, Magic fans should appreciate that. We've got a pretty special group of young athletes. I think you made a valid point earlier when you said that the Magic seemed like they were kind of getting into this, that stride at the same time that they were doing so uh, last season, if the NBA does return, what do you think? Um, what are your expectations for this team? Well, like I said, uh, you know, it's hard to know what's gonna what's gonna happen. Uh, you, you, when you lay off this long, it's difficult to predict who's gonna be hot and who's maybe gonna you know have players that come back that aren't weren't quite ready physically to to resume the season. You never know. We won't know until until it happens. But I, I did like the direction the team was headed in. But again, it's going to be a two or three month delay, so it's very unpredictable. Um, 1999, the uh, the year that there was a lockout, we came back. The New York Knicks were were not a very good team um, early, and then all of a sudden just caught fire, you know, because I think some other teams were in as great a shape. So I think they were, you know, they were a team that came out of nowhere and and had a great season. So you know, maybe there's an opportunity for a team out there to do that this year. Now, David, during this season, it, it felt as if we were really 
rolling, right? Very similar to what you said before that kind of felt like we were hitting that peak, kind of how we did last season. Um, but if the stars did align and we did have basketball late July, what would you say is one thing that you hope that the Magic improve on? Something that you felt as if you know that the team could get there, but if they just put a little more focus on there, you know, the team can kind of get better in that sense. Yeah, I think uh, the team was showing that it could be um, an elite defensive team. So, you know, I, I don't really think, Anthony, that suddenly you're going to see guys that have never been great three-point shooters suddenly be great three-point shooters. But I think what you could look for is for a team that has shown an ability to be a top five defensive team to, um, to be that kind of ball club in that situation. So that's what I would look for. I would look for, you know, a team that um, is scrappy and very tenacious defensively, can lock people down and give yourself a chance to win because we've seen this team do that last year, the second half of the season. And at times this year, we are starting to see it when things turned around. Now, offensively, the team had really made huge strides. So if you, if, you know, if, if they could continue that, that improved offensive play and also pick up what we know they're capable of doing defensively, then, you know, we could really have something special at the end of, uh, of this summer and, and leading into next year. That certainly is the hope because we did make some big improvements offensively over the last couple of months before the, the, the games uh, were locked down. Definitely. Yeah, if we can mix that, that combination of the both, the defense being consistent and the offense, the way that we were playing, I think that you could have something special happening heading into the playoffs. Yeah, getting Isaac back is going to be big, obviously, because he's, he's huge. And I, whether he is able, if there is a, a remainder of the season finished out, whether he's able to play, I, I don't know. Um, you know. I know that he thinks that he, he's feeling good about it, but, but you know that uh, players have uh, have one view, and then you know the, the training, the, the physical people, uh, the medical people have have their view. So we'll see what happens. But he's a big part of it going forward. If not this year, then certainly next year. Would you say he's a defensive anchor when he is playing? Oh yeah, no doubt. I mean, I, I think if uh, if he had not been injured. What was it, January 1st at Washington, um, right there, at the, right, right at the beginning of the, the turn of the year. Um, if he doesn't go down, um, he is on, on pace to be a first-team all-defense. And he was starting to get the accolades, too. I mean, people were recognizing it. Coaches were beginning to talk about it. Opposing players were discussing it. So I think Jonathan was, he was on his way to being a first-team all-defensive player. And, you know, he's still very young and and – you know, it's going to get a lot better. So that bodes well. Oh, yeah. The future for sure is bright for him here with, with the team. Now, David, uh, one question I want to ask you is, what did it mean to you when you got that call uh, from the Orlando Magic to let you know you're going to be inducted into the Hall of Fame? Um, how was that process? How did you find out? And how was that initial reaction um, to hearing the news? It was, I think, September of, uh, yeah, it was early September, around Labor Day of last year so not uh not 19 it would have been 18 um alex martins called me and asked me to meet him for lunch and um so i met alex for lunch here in orlando and um uh, you know i didn't know what he wanted to talk about We're, we we've been friends for a long time so you know and i didn't really think much much of it because you know we we, we, we talk a lot but um you know he the, at the at the lunch he brought it up he said We're, we want to put you in the hall of fame and i was blown away i didn't see that coming. So um, it was a, it was a surprise. It was, I was a little, probably a little emotional and uh, uh, very appreciative, but it's, it's been a great organization to work for. They really are. They're, they're terrific owners and um, the front office is outstanding. They're great, solid people all the way through the organization. Um, one of the best organizations and not just me saying it. I mean, there, there are people that, all through pro sports, um, the Magic have a very good reputation. So proud to have been a part of it for such a long time. I, I hope your induction is, is a token of appreciation, not, not just from the organization, but also from the fan base. And knowing that your name is going to be, you know, with the building for, you know, hopefully forever and ever, which I, I would imagine is the ultimate compliment. Yeah, it is. You know, when you hang around long enough, then, uh, you know, good things happen, I guess. But I have been around a long time. I've seen, I've seen a lot, uh, and um, it's great to be recognized for that. Um, I'm very appreciative. Absolutely. Now, David, we're going to jump into one of my favorite segments, which is um, In the Ozone. 
uh, with David Steele, which is kind of rapid fire. So we're going to ask you, we're going to alternate and just ask you a couple questions. All right. Um, okay. Obviously, right now, the Orlando Magic, we don't have any jerseys retired. The only one that we have is is the number six jersey, the fans. But if you were to retire one jersey from a player, which jersey and which player would you would you choose? Well, it would be tough because obviously we have um, we have four guys. I mean, the, the the Mount Rushmore of the Magic is pretty easy. Some teams not as clear cut, but you know, with Shaq, Penny, Tracy, and Dwight, um, those are four guys that were first team All NBA, um, all multiple time All Stars, Defensive Players of the Year. Um, if you, I guess you know, there's there's several ways to look at it. Then you got Nick Anderson, the guy that was the first player drafted, uh, still works for the team, had a great career. So you could look at it. I, I see the argument for a lot of different ways. I probably, if, if you pin me down and said, you got to pick one guy, I'd probably go with the guy that that, um, that, that lit the fuse for, for all of the, the greatness in the 90s, the first run that we had, and that would be Shaq. Um, you know, I mean, Shaq and Penny were, were the ones that started this thing and uh, put Orlando Ma- Magic Basketball on the map. So, you know, if you, if you had to pick one, I'd probably go with uh, the big fella. Uh, what is your favorite memory as an Orlando Magic broadcaster? Uh, boy, there, there are, there are so many, um, you know, I, I would probably say the, the first preseason game, uh, it, it's amazing that that game still stands out in my mind as vividly as it does, because it was just such an exciting time in Orlando. Um, uh, the city was just on fire about having a professional sports team. Uh, the old arena was just jam packed. It was the Detroit Pistons um, fans and, and, and broadcasters. And I don't think we, any of us really um, realized that it was only a preseason game, you know, for the Pistons. But uh, for us, it meant everything. And the crowd was just uh, tremendous that night, winning that game and, and seeing Chuck Daly and, uh, you know, Bill Lambeer and Thomas and Dumars and all those guys on the they really, in the end, tried to win that game. It was, it, it's a vivid memory in my mind. It really is. So I would say that's probably still near the top of the list. Um, I did radio, you know, for nine years. So, and, and I did the games by myself until Jeff Turner joined me on radio in 1997. So I did a lot of basketball um, solo on radio for many years. And those 95 playoff games were radio for me and with no color announcer. So, um, you know, those, those games stand out in my mind too. You know, the, uh, the Chicago Bull beating Michael Jordan, um, the Knicks big steal against Michael in game one that turned that series uh, around. I, I firmly believe that if Nick had not made that play, if we don't win that, that game, uh, Jordan and Pippen and the Bulls would have, uh, would have won that series. And it was still in a, you know, a dicey series. It could have gone either way even after that. But, um, that was a great play. That's a great memory in my mind. Um, eliminating Chicago that year and Horace lifted up on, on, on his teammates' shoulders in, in Chicago Stadium. Uh, that's a great memory. Um, and then, of course, the 09 teams. We've got some great ones there with, um, you know, the, the victories, huge victories in 2009 to reach the finals. So, you know, there are a lot. I mean, you know, you look at the magic history and it's a, it's a pretty colorful history. Um, You've had Shaq and Penny. You've had um, you've had those teams. You had the Hard and Hustle years, Daryl Armstrong and Bo Outlaw and Ben Wallace, and then you had Tracy McGrady. And of course, you know that's another great one. Sixty-two points uh, in a game. Tracy throwing the ball off the backboard and dunking it in a live game. Uh, great memories. Uh, and then you have the Dwight Howard years, and uh, and things are starting to pick up again. So uh, a lot, a lot of great memories. That is awesome. And it's hard to choose one. There's so many good ones uh, with, with the Magic. Um, one other question for you, David. Um, favorite Magic duo of all time, in your opinion? Yeah. Two players. It doesn't matter what position. Just two players that play together. Yes. Yeah. I would. It has to be Shaq and Penny, right? I mean, I, I think it probably does. Duos. Um, because T-Mac needed, he needed more help. It could have been T-Mac and Grant Hill. You know, that, that could have been a dangerous duo, True. but it just wasn't meant to be because Grant was injured. But uh, so, uh, and then Dwight had, you know, arguably Richard, who was, who was the better player? I mean, that, that's a tough, that's tough between Richard, Keto, even Jameer. Those, 
all three of those guys were really, really good players. It's hard to say that there's a duo there with Dwight. Um, so I think the duo would have to be Shaq and Penny, best duo. And lastly, um, you've had a career that stemmed, you know, for so long and you've had so much experience. Uh, you've, like I said, have been doing it right because you're still around. What is something that you say is vital to, to your success? Um, well, there, there are a lot of things I think that are important. Um, you know, you have to, you have to, you have to grind every day. You have to believe that um, every game is just as important as the last game, um, that somebody out there is listening or watching that, you know, it's a big deal too, that, it, you know, they may not, uh, they may not watch that many games or they, they may just be tuning in. I mean, you just have to know that every, every game you have to take seriously and you have to do your very best job. So, you know, my preparation is the same for every game. It has been for 30 plus years. Um, I put a lot into it. I, you know, I, I don't use probably 75, 80% of, uh, of the things that I, you know, that I prepare for on a given night. But, but I feel like if something happens then you know, it's a, yeah, I'm going to be ready for it because I've got, you know, I've thought about all of the possible scenarios and, and looked at all the players and, you know, I'm ready for to broadcast. You know, I feel like if I, if I don't do that preparation, uh, that, uh, you know, I'm not going to be doing my job well. So hard work is the first thing. And, uh, you know, another, th another big key is to, to, to be, uh, and not, not think of yourself as bigger than the game or as even as big as the game. That uh, you know, as a broadcaster, you know this is not uh, brain surgery. You know, you're not. Uh, don't get too too uh, carried away with yourself and uh, ego. Um, a lot of people have a lot of ego, um, which you know it works for a lot of people. But I think uh, I think humility goes a long way too. So uh, just work hard. Uh, let the game be the story. Uh, let your color guy be the story, and um, just try and and uh, you know do your best to, to amplify the great moments and be there to punch home the, the big moments when they happen. David, I, I hope you plan on doing this for another 30, 40 years, <laughs> because I, I honestly can't even fathom watching a magic game without, without hearing your commentary on it. So it's, <laughs> it's always a joy. So, um, David, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we definitely appreciate everything that you do and, um, and you guys are great. Appreciate the time. You guys do a good job on this. Jeff Turner said, oh, yeah, you got to talk to those guys. Great. <laughs> that's that's awesome. awesome. And that's Quarantine with David Steele. Thank you for listening to the Ozone Podcast, the voice of Magic fans. Be sure to visit our website, theozonepod.com. And remember to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on all your favorite podcast listening platforms.